He could punch. That's all he could do. He, he was a real puncher. All offense, no defense. He had a dynamite right hand. Frankie was, you know, kind of reckless. He mixed with some bad people, and they killed him. Frankie DePaul was one of the most colorful boxers to come around. I mean, he was in the mold of Rocky Graziano, you know, and uh, a slugger, a guy who the fans loved. If you ever saw his fight with Freddie Williams, when he knocked Freddie Williams out, Frankie would started throwing wide looping punches. If you were on the end of one of those, he'd knock you totally unconscious. He would go out there to knock out all the time. You know, he wasn't a stylish fighter. He, he, he was a crowd pleaser. He was a street fighter. There was always rumors of him being, you know, tied up with the mob. Very appealing to a young, a young person like me because he was such a hard puncher, such an aggressive fighter. He could hit anybody with that right hand and they'd go. He wasn't always in the best of shape, but that right hand was the equalizer. Al Braverman, you know, he trained him. And when I was writing about him, he said that, uh, Frank, they take him out to the park, right? And he didn't want to run. What he would do after a while, he'd duck into the men's room and splash water on his face. And then he'd go to see Al, he, he was finished. He said, look, I'm a strength and sweat. Al knew what he was doing. I love Frankie. I love Frankie. I got along great with him. I boxed with him too. He didn't pull any punches with me. He took the money he won from the uh, Tiger fight and he went to Vegas and he blew the whole thing. <laughs> you know, on, I mean, important things like booze and broads, you know. And one of the most exciting fights, uh, I remember, was his bout with Charlie Devil Green. And I remember when he fought Charlie Green. And when they fought, Frankie DePaulo was just coming on the scene. Where he dropped Green, Green came back. It was like a miniature Zale Graziano fight. A lot of people don't know that, but when, when, when they fought, they made a bet with Charlie, Charlie Green in it, because Charlie had his brothers and stuff, and they made a two, it was about $2,000, $3,000 bet. The fight started, Frankie hit Charlie Green and shook him up, and everything, but Charlie turned around through that right hand and knocked Frankie DePaula out. They was all in shock and everything. But they had to pay that $2,000 <laughs> for that fight and everything. And you let me tell you, that was more, they made more money on the side of the betting than they did with Charlie fighting and everything. Is it true that he boxed with Carter in prison? Just talk about that story. Well, I heard that story. I never saw him box in prison. Uh, the way I heard it, like they knocked each other down. Carter would like paralyze you. Frankie would knock you out. So I, Frankie, for one shot, hit harder than Ruben. He was a bigger guy. You know, he walked around like 200 pounds, you know. Ruben soaking wet with a rock in each hand was like 158. He'd stuff himself, he still weighed 158. And they would box and Ruben handled them. I saw him knock Frankie down. They boxed in Jersey City, too. But Frankie had a knockdown on Ruben. I think it was in prison. Go to check and make sure that DePaul is in good shape. And he walks over to take a good look at him. He took some bombs there, but strange to say, one of them seemed to wake him up. So every TV boxing card has a walkout bout. And the reason you have a walkout bout is if the main event ends early. This way you have a bout to fill the rest of the TV airtime. On this card, Forster knocks out Tiger early. Frankie DePaula became the walkout bat. We'll have a special six-round bout coming up for you. Freddie Williams from Brooklyn at 173. He'll be wearing the white trunks. And in black trunks from Jersey City, Frank DePaula. And everybody was just, you know, they watch a round or two and walk out. So the first round, Williams comes out and hits DePaula on the chin. DePaula goes down. Everybody gets up to walk out. DePaula gets up and knocks down Williams. Everybody sits down. How about that? Williams down. The next round, Williams is battering the Pauler and against the ropes, everybody figures it's over. They get up to walk out, and, and the Pauler hits him a shot, knocks him against the rope. They all sit down. Solid left, another one right on the button. The referee is keeping his eye on uh, DePaula. He may have thoughts about stopping it. The third round is a knockdown by Williams. The fourth round is a knockdown by... So everybody's going crazy. So finally, late in the fight, DePaula throws a shot and knocks out Williams cold. With about a minute 45 to go in the round, 
De Paula came from nowhere. And Williams is down again and it's all over. Forster, after waiting a decade, wins the title. But everybody left that arena that night talking about Frankie De Paula. The next big fight for Frankie is against Dick Tiger, the former middleweight and light heavyweight champion. The same guy Bob Forster just knocked out. And I was world's middleweight champion of the world. I lose it and I gain it back. And I became the light heavyweight champion of the world. And I lost it. Maybe I fight, I'll be fighting until I get it back. How do you feel approaching a fight like this? I'm just going to try my best like I, like I always do. You know, I take them, I take them. If I win, I lose. I just take them as they come. You know, there's no, there's no other way to take them. Dick Tiger had all just lost to, to, to Bob Foster, and his career was almost over. And what a fight that was. The last few rounds, they were both exhausted. <laughs> I think Tiger went down twice in one round, and DePaula went down twice in one round. Now, Dick Tiger's hard to knock out. Bob Foster's the only person that did it. Oh, my God. I mean, Frankie was, Frankie was on that night, boy. I mean, he was on that night. When Tiger signed to fight Frankie, I couldn't imagine what was going to happen. After I saw Tiger handle Rubin in May 65, I couldn't see Frankie surviving Dick Tiger because Frankie didn't like to train. He was strong as a bull, but he didn't like to train. He didn't like to run, and uh, it's Dick Tiger in there. So we're sitting ringside, and everyone came down there from Jersey City. They had uh, what they called back then go-go dancers, right? And they're all sitting ringside, Frankie, Frankie, they're yelling. It was great. The garden was screaming so loud, they couldn't believe it. Guys were jumping out of their chairs. They couldn't believe Dick Tiger was knocked down like that. He got up shaky, like a reed in the wind. He's shaking. And then in the fourth round, Tiger lit into Frankie. You know, he had Tiger down twice in the second round. Of course, Tiger got up and knocked him down twice. It was uh, voted uh, the fight of the year. You could hear the body shots landing all the way in the back of the arena. It was one of the best fights to this day I have ever seen. And then it went to the 10 round distance. And Frankie did the best he could, but Tiger just stayed on the body and uh, it took it out of him. Now the garden has a dilemma. Because Foster had knocked out Tiger so easily, fans weren't going to pay to see that rematch. Since Frankie put up such a good fight against Tiger, even though he lost, he gets the shot against Foster. And the only reason he got a title fight with Bob Foster was because he drew in the fans. But Teddy Brennan, the matchmaker of Madison Square Garden, had a saying, I never made a fight that I didn't want to watch that I didn't think both sides had a chance to win. And he wasn't going to do the fight. And they announced in the paper that DePaula versus Foster will be held in the Jersey City Armory. And Teddy Brenner gets a call. I was in the uh, office just by coincidence that day. And uh, from Irving Mitchell Felt, who was the chairman of the board of Madison Square Garden. And the conversation went like, Teddy, I read that DePaula is fighting Foster in Jersey City Armory. And Brenner said, yes. He said, Why isn't he fighting in the garden? He says, because it's a mismatch. He said, well, what will happen? He said, well, DePaula will get knocked out in one round and it'll draw 18,000 people. And Irving Mitchell felt, said to his matchmaker, Teddy Brenner, Teddy, we're in the business of making money. Make the fight, regardless of consequences. Teddy Brenner made the fight. True to his world. word, they drew 18,000 people and after getting knocked down, Bob Foster knocked out Frank DePaula in the first round. There it is. There it is. It's all over. DePaula down for the third. Later on, there were rumors that uh, the fight was fixed because nobody expected DePaula to win. Yeah. DePaula was just so embarrassed. He, he actually told some woman, I went in the soup. I mean, you know, that's how, that's how embarrassed he was. But he had great potential, but I don't think he had really had the desire or the discipline. He had the raw material, but you know, you need so many more ingredients to be successful. He just, you know, he just didn't have that. It's amazing how the guy, you get that close and you have it, but then all of a sudden, it just, it just, you just don't get over that bridge. You just don't get over the bridge. He was also, uh, uh, what you'd say, um, his activities outside of the ring were not exactly kosher. He was a bouncer and a rag doll in Union City. He was mobbed up. 
In New York, an investigation of alleged corruption in professional boxing resulted today in three grand jury indictments against boxer Frankie DiPola and two men identified by an assistant district attorney, Larry Goldman, as figures in the mob or mafia. They are Joe Calabro and Jimmy Nap Napoli. Well, the rumor, there's always a rumor, right? But yes, everybody said he was. I mean, it was Gary Garofolo was his manager who ran a, a, a string of these topless bars in New Jersey. Obviously, his money came from somewhere. I don't think it was the Catholic Church. Like I say, I work the organized crime section. The less said about it, the better. You can't answer. That's okay. You don't have to answer. But uh, was, was Frankie controlled by the mob? Well... The guys that controlled him were, were fringe mob guys, I believe. You know, we know who they are, you know? It's not, not for me to say, it's just that, uh, you know, he uh, took direction from them. He was a little more naive than a lot of people, and that got him in trouble, you know? Well, I, I liked Frank. Everybody liked Frank because, you know, he was a nice guy and you knew we were going to see a fight. He was always yeah, a head breaker for the mob or a collector for the mob or a runner for the mob. He ran uh, bookmaking sheets and everything else. He mixed with some bad people and they killed him. To what, what was behind that is still is, you know, unclear. But it had to do with his, um, his activities outside of the ring, not inside of the ring. And he got killed, as a lot of people think, because of that girl. I, I was told that he was trying to shake down some drug, drug dealers in, in Jersey, and that's how they set him up, someplace coming out of the driveway or something. And I got that from a, a, a guy who would know, Tony Knapp, uh, who had a nightclub over there. He was gunned down in a, in a very brutal, almost like an assassination. I guess he did something wrong. I heard it was his manager that shot him. He was told to stay away from this guy's stepdaughter. And Frankie was uh, a ladies' man. And Frankie, he was, a, he was the type of guy that he figured he could knock out anybody, which is true. And um, he couldn't understand what I tell him. It's not a fighter that's going to kill you. It's some little jelly wink with a 45. You know, they're not going to fight you. They're going to kill you. They'll throw a stick of dynamite in your bedroom window or they're going to shoot you. And there's so many women out there, don't risk doing this. You've been told. That's, I mean, a famous saying, right? You've been told. One time, you've been told. And he wouldn't listen. And they got him coming out of... Uh, this girl's apartment in an alley, and these two guys were accused of it. One was Garofola, and the other was this guy, Richie Phelan, and they shot him with a 45. Boom, boom, boom. Frankie DePaula, he had a heart too, because he didn't die right away. It took him another four months. Frankie is very strong, strong as a horse. It took him quite a while to die. He went down from 200 pounds to about 125. I saw him in a Jersey City Medical Center. I went up there to talk to him. And um, he told me and he told the other detectives that they did it. And uh, they got the witness on the stand. I was at the trial. And uh, she flip-flopped in the middle of it. I'm not sure. You know, there's a lot of guys that look like Garofola. You know, they, it, they had a good lawyer. And um, they walked. The fact that he lived hard uh, lived fast and died young. You know, he kind of epitomized, you know, the, the uh, you know, that type of uh, fighter back in that era, you know. Frankie DePaul is just one of those sad, sad boxing stories. But he was truly one of these legendary fighters, larger than life, and again, he didn't live long, but he certainly lived exciting. The winner by a TKO, Frank DePaul. One minute and 24 seconds of the...